I'm going to talk about Crazy is a numbers game. But before that, I'll introduce myself. So I started out as just running a small podcast. And this was in the good old days when I had hair. And <laughs> I was in my bedroom just with a microphone, my laptop. And then slowly that turned into a business, turned into the Bitcoin Collective. Where on the podcast, we kind of just had a, we had a fuck it moment, is what I like to call it. And we're like, we're always talking about America. They're doing this, they're doing that. Why don't we do something in the UK? So we put a call out and say, we want to do a conference. Would anyone come? And the response was incredible. Um, we had so many people wanting to sponsor it, wanting to come and attend it. Uh, so we put on the conference and it became the UK's first major Bitcoin conference. And this is one of my favorite photos, but it's not my favorite photo. This one is. <laughs> and this was a hem party, photo bombing, Samson Mao, Obi and Jeff, um, amongst others in there. And yeah, it's just, I had to put that on, on the screen. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about crazy is a numbers game. And this is a concept that you can apply out with Bitcoin. And it doesn't just apply to Bitcoin. So I want to introduce this guy, Ignaz Semmelweis. And in the mid 19th century, when hospitals were places where people would go to die, rather than be cured, and germs and bacteria were not really understood. Ignas was a Hungarian doctor in the medical school in Vienna, in the general hospital in Vienna, and he was assigned to the maternity clinic. And this maternity, this maternity clinic had two wards. It had a doctor on ward, and it had a midwife on ward. And as soon as Ignaz came in, he realized that the doctor on ward had five times more deaths than the midwife run ward. So he started to question this. He was like, why is this happening? He wanted to find out why. Nobody else wanted to find out why. He went down and he done a lot of tests. So he went through patients' records. Nothing. He went through birthing positions. So in the doctor run ward, they would birth them on their back. And then on the midwife run ward, the woman would be on their side. Nothing. Didn't make a difference. And then he stopped the priest ringing his bell. So every time that a mother passed away, a priest would come through and ring a bell. And he thought maybe the sound was so piercing that it was causing mothers to die. Still, ridiculous as it sounds, wasn't that. Sunlight, he even looked at that, and environmental factors. Opening windows, closing windows, closing blinds, still nothing. Until one day, one of his friends and his colleague at the hospital, he cut his finger whilst doing an autopsy. And he began to develop symptoms, which was the same as these mothers were dying from. It was called childbed fever. And subsequently, his colleague died. This was the eureka moment for Ignaz. He realized that in the doctor's run ward, the doctors were coming from uh, performing autopsies straight into the maternity ward. And they weren't washing their hands. They were clearly taking something. Germs and bacteria weren't really understood back then, and uh, taking them into the maternity ward. So what he done was he ordered everyone to wash their hands uh, with chlorine. And the figures were staggering. So as soon as he implemented this, the figures dropped from around 18% down to averaging below 5%. So you'd think if the mortality rate is 
dropping this significantly, then this would be applauded. He would be applauded. He was not. So this is my drawing, by the way. <laughs> this is my day job. <laughs> um, he was rejected by the medical establishment, even though he had overwhelming evidence that hand washing was bringing down mortality rates. And the reason why the, the medical establishment rejected this, they didn't want to be seen, they were doctors, they didn't want to be seen as killing mothers, that they were the ones that were doing it. So this idea was rejected. He kept pushing, he wrote about it, he protested about it, and he kept pushing and pushing and pushing until he was ousted out of medicine. A couple years later, he was put into a mental institute, and he died at the age of 47. We're going to come back to this story. So what do I mean by crazy is a numbers game? Because I'd argue we're all crazy. And here's why. So I've also drawn this. So there's a bit of inaccuracy, but you get the idea of it. So on the y-axis, you can see the perception of an idea. And on the x-axis, you can see the number of people who believe in the idea. And we've got blue is crazy. And the more, the higher the perception of the I, no, sorry, I'll go on the x-axis first. The number of people who believe in the idea, so zero on the left, the perception of the idea is seen as being crazy. And the more people that believe in the idea, that craziness goes down. And then I, I believe that there's this, I've just put inflection point there. You could also refer to Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. And then I've overlaid something else. And this is where it gets interesting. Is you're then classed as a genius at some point. It goes from number of people who believe in the idea. You're not, you're crazy. You're not a genius. And over time, the more people that buy into that idea, that genius, I'll just say line for now, goes up. Here's a few examples of that over history. So 1633, the sun, not the earth, is at the center of the solar system. Galileo. And for saying this, he was put on trial by the Roman Catholic Church. But we know that the earth is not the center of the solar system. Likewise, 1900, AC electrical supply system is too dangerous to be widely adopted. This was during the AC-DC wars between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. And this was some propaganda that was done back then. And now AC is widely adopted over DC. But at the time, you were crazy. 2000, the internet is a passing fad. Deemed crazy for having this idea that is different to the status quo, the norms. So that's where I got the idea of this, is one person with an idea, you're crazy. You're doing stuff completely different to what everyone else is doing. But the more people that buy into that idea, the more people that you have behind you, thinking the same way, doing the same things, does hit that inflection point. And then maybe, are you a genius? I don't know. See, we're all just fleas in a jar. Does anyone recognize this? Nobody, good. Okay, a couple. So this is a famous experiment that is done. You get a jar with a load of fleas. You put the fleas in the jar, and they just jump out. Because fleas have incredible ability to jump really high. But what happens if you put a lid on the jar? They jump up and they bang their head. So over time, 
they realized that they didn't want to be banging their head all the time, so they jumped just below the lid. And they keep doing that over and over again. So if you take away the lid, they just jump to the height of the jar, and they don't jump out. But interestingly, if you put a new flea in the jar, it just jumps out. Because it's like, well, I can jump this high, so I'm just going to jump out. Why are you all jumping to that height? So all the other fleas are like, well, he just jumped out. I'm going to jump out. And then they all jump out. And then there's no fleas in the jar. And this is where Bitcoin comes in. I believe that Satoshi showed us that there was no lid in the jar that we've been living in. And made us realize that we can jump out and not live within that limitation that we were currently, or that we were living in before. So now, one by one, we're all just jumping out. We're learning about Bitcoin. We're realizing why, why are we just jumping to this height? When I know that we can do better, we can jump a lot higher. We jump outside the jar, and it feels like we're kind of looking in the jar now, that every, what everyone else is doing. So if you haven't followed that, the jar is like the fiat system. <laughs> so I have gone very, very fast. I'm going to try and slow down a little bit because there is only two slides left. Um, but going back to Semmelweis, how we started this talk, he now has a university named after him. He is classed as the savior of mothers. Yet at the time, he was deemed as being crazy. Now, he could be classed as genius. And I'm sure it was similar for Satoshi and all of us. At some point, with our families or colleagues, we might have been deemed crazy for buying Bitcoin, not shutting up about Bitcoin. But there is a tide that's turning a little bit, that I feel, that now it doesn't feel as crazy as it did four years ago. And I just wrote this. I don't know if it's a quote or it just came to my head. It might be. Ideas will be rejected by those with the most to lose. And that's what Semmelweis experienced is the medical establishment had a lot to lose at that time. They were the ones that were trusted, and they had been seen to be curing and delivering babies. But he was saying, no, you're actually the ones that are causing this. So I'm going to leave you on this. And it's don't stop being crazy, because that's what moves us forward. That's what moves humanity forward, is the ideas, I feel like Steve Jobs, but the ideas that are against the status quo, that are not the norm. And Prince, he was talking about this earlier on a panel next door. And it is. It's thinking critically, asking why. And that's what Ignaz done at the start. He came in to the clinic, and he said, why is this happening? But nobody else was interested. And he was deemed crazy for that. And that's why I want to leave you on. Just please, don't stop being crazy. Thank you.